Hello. Uh, hi. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm hi. David Sims. I'm Griffin Newman. Uh, I'm a uh, staff writer at The Atlantic, and uh, this I'm is uh, that guy. Arthur. Uh, thanks for coming out on this apocalypse day. Can I ask just an informal survey out of curiosity? Who had seen the episode before? Okay, so a lot of you are like we're converting you tonight. Cool. Okay, so we got a hard sell to do here in the next half hour. Oh, no, it's good. Yeah. Come on, that, that's a good sell. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So the tech. Uh -huh. um, we're pals, but you also go yes. off and you make this show. You make this TV show, The Tick. D this David complicated. And I, we yes, host a podcast don't know. together. We host a podcast together. Uh, we're very, very good friends. I told him. Uh, that his assignment for tonight was to treat this like a professional job. He wants me to like Charlie Rose him. He wants me I mean, very in, not, in, in a serious interview way. That's right. all. Nothing. Right. right. Yes. 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 Right. right. Maybe there's a better Matt Lauer. Matt. I want you to Matt. Mm. No. All right. All right. All right. All right. Still good. Is there one good person? Like, Terry Gross. I want yes. you to Terry you want me to Gross Terry me Gross tonight. Right. Okay. I want okay. you to be very professional and serious right. and probing. So I should go to Philadelphia, please. Okay. Do this via Skype. <laughs> uh, no, you asked me as we were walking up to the stage, the, the final card there. The In Memoriam. In Memoriam, uh, memory of Terry Wendell, who was, uh, he, he uh, passed away like five days after we wrapped okay. uh, shooting, which I, uh, he, he was there uh, from the first day we shot the pilot until the last day we shot on season two. And he was the special effects supervisor. Okay. And he is this uh, crazy guy who had this amazing career that started out with him. He was the background painter on heavy metal. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he became a matte painter for like ILM sure. and for Lucasfilm. And his two big like credits that are awesome uh, are he did uh, the Emperor's uh, Force Lightning. Like he would, he would, wow. Because he became yeah. a sort of like effects animator. Mm. And then he did the proton streams huh. in Ghostbusters. And Ghostbusters. He is the guy who was single handedly responsible for uh, that. And he passed away like a week after we That's finished terrible. filming. Um, and he was like, he was a, a, an incredible dude. Mm. He was one of those guys who just like, uh, filming TV shows, difficult. Sure. Uh, so we're here to talk about? Right. And it's long hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone gets like worn down, and he was one of those guys where you'd like come to set, and he was on set every day, and he, you just always were like, I'm an asshole for <laughs> taking any of this for granted, you know? Right. Because he was like, Wow, isn't this cool? So constantly, yeah. yeah. The tick. The tick, sure, yeah. So this first season of the show, because mm -hmm. we we just watched this first episode of the second season in which Arthur is sort of for the first time gung ho. Accepting the call. Right. He's right. accepting the call. Right. So the first season of the show... Refusing uh, the call. You're refusing the call. Yes, a Which lot. is part of the sort of classic Joseph Campbell right. superhero cycle, yes. right? Like where Tick is this big, extroverted, happy do-gooder. He's and a you physical manifestation of the call. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he is... Seven feet of the call. There with a phone. Yes. And being like, you know, pick up, and yeah. you're like, ah, hold, there's the... Hold, you, hold, Sure, hold, yeah. you know, if, have you seen me? Right, this, right. You know, this is, you got the wrong guy. Yeah. So when, you f when you're first doing this show, when you're first coming aboard for the first... Yeah. How are you talking about that? Like... Were, did you know the whole time it was going to be the first season? You're just is all about your development into superhero. -dom. All about you opening the door. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. I think you know this is the third TV show based on this property. That's right. Which was originally a comic book, and the yes. thing that's really unique about the Tick is that the same guy did all four things. Right. I should have clarified. You know, it's Ben Edlund, ben Edlund the creator. Right. Created He's the it when one. he was 16 years old as part of his local comic store's newsletter. Mm -hmm. Then they started self-publishing it. He continued writing it and drawing it uh, throughout college. Sure. And then by the time he graduated, the Ninja Turtles... Right, indie comics were a thing. ...had become hip. Right. And so everyone was just like, we'll buy the rights to any black and white comic book that feels vaguely satirical. That you could maybe make a toy out of, right. Well, it was literally, he got a deal for licensing before they got a deal for the show. A company wow. was like, we think we can sell Chapstick based on this. And then off the promise of the chapstick and the party hats and the skateboards, then they sold it as a TV show. And he was a very young guy without any TV experience writing a, a Saturday morning cartoon show right. that then became notorious for being very weird. Which I loved as a child. Right. Um, yep. And it was one of those things where, like, if you were a weird kid, you'd be like, this feels... It looks so, like right. what it's I recognize. It's got the same style. It's the color, and he's a big bug. I, I can, Everything you know. they're saying is insane. He's muscly, but right. Right, yes. right. Uh, and uh, then, he, then he rebooted as a sitcom in the early 2000s. And then this version, um, 
his sort of explicit goal was it had always been kind of a satire first and foremost. Yes, it was subversive. And he, in the time between the, the 2001 series mm-hmm. um, and this series, uh, had worked on like Firefly yep. and Supernatural. He wrote one of the Gotham, best ever Angel episodes. Angel, all the one where they all turn into puppets. sort of uh, hyper serialized emotional sort of sci-fi dramas, and he wanted to find a way to put that level of storytelling into the tick. Yeah. So there was the sort of reverse engineering of okay, we got these two characters. One of them is defined by the fact that uh, he never questions what he's doing at all. Right. The core of the tick is that he just is like, I'm correct, and just like zooms forward. Yes. So you don't want to have that guy like looking in the mirror going like, who am I? Like, right. So then you go Arthur. <laughs> Who's Arthur? Who has, Arthur, I feel like, has been different in every iteration. Like, he, yeah. he's more malleable as a character. Right. But the key was always this guy is is like on the verge of a panic attack. Like, he's here's this tick. What are you doing? And he's not very fit. Sure. And he's not very skilled. Uh, but he's got awareness, yeah. and he's got sort of a moral compass. And so Ben was like, I want to do the math. And Ben's a very big thinker. Sure. So I, like, I had sent in, I, I got this show through uh, self-taping, which I say to this audience tonight because uh, 10 years of people tell me I had to move out of New York if right. I ever wanted to get on a TV show. Right. Uh, were uh, proven wrong conclusively by my uh, stubbornness mm-hmm. and uh, 10 years and of I thank you for staying in New not York. making much rent. <laughs> uh, but it finally paid off. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, I, I sent in self-tapes and he liked them and then so I went out to coffee with him and Ben proceeded to explain to me uh, every single responsibility of this job. Of the, specifically of Arthur. In like of what of you're going to do as Arthur. Right, and it wasn't him explaining here's the plot line for five seasons. Yeah. It was him saying, like, I, I really want to make a show where we question why this guy would go into battle. Because every other version of The Tick, it's a given. He's a comedic archetype. Wouldn't it be funny if a superhero was stressed out? Yeah. And so he was like, I want to find some sort of emotional founding for what kind of trauma could lead to this guy simultaneously having that drive and that fear. Right, so you're the guy he's putting all of this interest. Right, you, he, you're the guy looking in the mirror. Right, so Ben just like proceeded to, for an hour, explain all that to me, and then go like, so you know, you're one of the guys I'm considering. And I was like, <laughs> Jesus Christ, you know? Uh-huh. You know, I mean, the character has to be funny, but, you know, the audience can't laugh at him, so, you know. Right, because you could so easily just be the wise, wisecracking sidekick, right? You know, who's right. bumbling and... Right, or a show that is rooted in this character having, for people who haven't watched season one, I mean, he has this very traumatic past where his father was uh, uh, killed, killed in, in front, front of him, of him right. as sort of collateral damage in a superhero battle. I think that's referenced in this episode, yes. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But then he was institutionalized yeah. and uh, medicated and misdiagnosed and diagnosed and all this sort of stuff. So it was like, someone has to play all that real, yep. but they also have to uh, uh, sell jokes. Yeah. You can't tip the scales too heavy in one direction or another. And this season is going to be a lot of refusal of the call because it's like, uh, I think you and I both uh, uh, find it frustrating. And I feel like there's a shorthand of just like, oh, these movies where people refuse the call. Sure. Where and it feels like force, where it's like, well, we, we, right. we got 20 more minutes till he right. answers. Where then people feel like, oh, I don't like it when characters refuse the call rather than I don't like it when it's done poorly. Sure. Because like the example I always think of, uh, and I'm sure he would agree with me on this, but the Ryan Reynolds Green Lantern movie, right. where the guy rules for 45 minutes, he's and they give him the lantern. Kick ass spider pilot. And he's he... like, not in. Interested. Right, right, right. And you're like, there's no reason why this guy wouldn't take the job. There's zero reason why this guy wouldn't take the job. Right. And so it was like, season one, let's stack the deck so fully against this guy. Mm-hmm. Then let's cast a dude who looks like he shouldn't be in an action scene. Right. And then try to, over the course of a season, justify why he'd keep doing it. Uh, which was fun to do. Sure. It's tough because you're like you're playing someone you had this sort of twitches and you had in in season one i feel like you were much more in your head your character was much more withdrawn and inside himself right and valerie and i valerie curry who plays my sister dot who's incredible on the show would always talk about because we were kind of the two normal humans on the show Sure, we're like the battle of like uh i don't want to be the character who's trying to stop the show from happening Right, you because know? then the audience is going to get mad at you. Right, you're like, I want to see Arthur fight with the tick. So it's like you have to justify it and you have to show enough sort of promise of how it's breaking down and evolution. All that having been said, it was very fun to start on season two. Well, that's And my, be right. like, first fucking scene, tick I'm in. And now I think we built sort of a basement mm-hmm. underneath what always was the tick house 
So hopefully there's a little more emotional grounding, but also if you just watch this episode, you get to just watch two people fight crime. So, so in season two, right, that's right. sort of my question is like, are you thinking of this as like a lot of the stuff that, you know, I had been playing that's going to be gone? Like, you know, Arthur is, has sort of unlocked himself a little more. Yeah, th yeah. That's the fun of this episode is what you're saying. You walk in, you're like, right. yeah, all right. Right. Sure, let's do it. Right, with no hesitation. It's yeah. just like, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think, you know, I, I was a big fan of the previous versions of The Tick growing up, mm -hmm. and I always related to Arthur, uh, probably first and foremost because he was small. He's a little guy. Little guy, uh, much like me. And the Tick very big. Much like you. <laughs> He's bigger That's than why me. we're friends. Sure, yes. Right. Uh, I like being friends with big guys <laughs> who can do the fighting for me. Um, no, but I, I think the thing that was always interesting to me is, I, you know, was trying to get this part and so analyzing it more was like, this guy is as nervous as I am all the time, yet he's doing this thing. Sure. You know? Like, yeah. I'm nervous. I can't get out of bed. Yeah, this yeah, guy is nervous, and he goes and he puts on the suit, fights a lobster. Mm -hmm. Like, yep. why does he do that? Mm -hmm. And so the core was, like, you don't want to have him... Now that he's accepting the call, he also can't transform into a guy who is well suited for this environment. He can't be tick too, right? That'd be he boring. can't be tick too. It's like you still want to play the history of all that this guy is. The thing that's kind of nice about TV is that uh, because it's so long mm -hmm. and you do seasons spread out, that like the the character backstory just becomes stuff that you've played. Sure. You know. Like, I had to do a lot of work going into the pilot, mm -hmm. but then from every episode there on out, you have the, the actual muscle memory of playing those scenes, yeah. which you can, like, recall on for trying to pull from uh, what the history of this dude is. Um, but, it, yeah, it was more fun to just be like, uh, now I have all that stuff in the back pocket. I'm mm -hmm. hopefully not abandoning it, but I get to be the guy who's nervous and still shows up. Right. Yeah. Um, so did you have another hour-long chat with Ben about, like, here's what's happening now? You never don't have hour-long <laughs> chats with Ben. I'll say that was the most direct one. Sure. The thing, the thing about Ben is that he talks a little bit like the tick. Okay. Like he never makes, like, casual conversation. Uh -huh. So you'll ask him a question, and it will take about 45 minutes to untangle. Right. Because he'll go like, what we're trying to achieve is the gnarliness of the tendrils, sort of creating a centrifugal force. And you're like, I'm just asking if he's eaten breakfast yet or not in this scene. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know, right. do you, am I holding the cup in my left hand or my right hand? Mm -hmm. And everything's like, like that. So there's, uh, I mean, which is, which is helpful in its own way because he's not uh, didactic. Mm. about like you have to do this right he talks a lot in terms of like this is the sort of storytelling movement i want to make or this is the tone of the thing i mean he's a comic book guy we're a comic book nerds yes. and i remember him for one scene saying like i want this to feel like when daredevil would show up in a spider-man comic and i was like i know exactly what you're saying that feeling of like oh this feels cool that the guy's in the wrong Thing. They're buddies, but also there's like kind of like a rival energy right. if Dare would, you know, right. like Spider-Man's like, this is my thing. Right, but that was probably the most direct note he's ever given. That's a good note. <laughs> it was a good note. It yeah. was a good note. He knew that was my language, yeah. Um, so, but like when the Tick, when the Tick first shows up, mm -hmm. sort of at least as a Saturday morning cartoon. Sure. It's making, f making fun of, it's subverting what, yeah. you know, the, that, that formula, the Saturday morning cartoon formula. Right. The, there's a big villain. Yeah. Here's your big hero. You right. know, like they're going to do battle in some silly way. I feel like now the tick, this tick yeah. is reacting to an entirely different superhero landscape. Oh yeah. yeah. Like where superheroes are like the leaders of society, like right. of our, like of our real society, basically. Like yeah. we look to the actors playing superheroes to, you know, sort of, Give us moral leadership. Yeah, we're right? like waiting to hear who Captain America endorses for president. Yes. Which I'm not saying in any negative way. No, I'm but genuinely at the edge of my seat <laughs> waiting to see who Chris Isn't Evans he like endorses. Isn't he like a CNN show where he like Probably. listens? He has like town yeah. halls and yeah. stuff. And like I feel like there's a little of that woven into this show where it's like this feels like the real world much yeah. more than old ticks felt like. Yeah, well, and especially as this season goes on, I mean, that was sort of his big season movement was like, I want to make a show about the bureaucracy of being a superhero. Right. Especially because with all these superhero franchises now, movies and TV, there's so much like the organizations and the leagues. Yes, right. And, you know, like, uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. just shows up and is cool. And Ben's like, I want to do a show where S.H.I.E.L.D. recruits you and you spend eight episodes doing paperwork. Yeah. 
And that's to if you haven't seen season two, there's right. Aegis, a the tons sort of, of paperwork. There's yeah. a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of like but you it's funny, it's sort of Gilliam esque, it's like well, all and this that's, right. Right, right. I mean I think the two things the tick are always it, the tick is always doing as a property every right. time Ben because he doesn't just redo the same storylines. He kind of resets every time he adapts it again. Right. That's sort of right. Right. So and so A, I think he just holds up a funhouse mirror to whatever is going on in superhero pop culture and reacts totally. to that yeah. rather than the stuff he's been pulling from in the past. Mm -hmm. So the cartoon show was on the same time as the X-Men cartoon, the Spider-Man cartoon, had stuff to go off of. He said when he did the sitcom in 2001, he felt a little untethered because it was more in conversation with live action adaptations of, uh, of cartoon cartoons. shows, mm. like the Flintstones movie and stuff like that sure. because it came out in the year between the first X-Men, the first Spider-Man. Spider so right. there wasn't really a language to go off of. Yeah. And now we're at such a surplus of like superhero content and how it's integrated into our society, as you said, that there's like all this stuff to go riff on. But it is that that juxtaposition between like the the extreme superhero stakes and like the most utterly mundane banal things, like uh, you know, us drinking coffee in yep. my shitty living room, yep. <laughs> or filling out form after form after form. And another big arc of this uh, season two is Superion, who's like our Superman, the Superman guy, uh, yep. analog, a very different character who's one letter different than Superion, <laughs> uh, than Superman. Uh, but he uh, uh, has this sort of like uh, uh, mental breakdown yep. over the fact that he starts reading tweets for the first time, right. because he's an alien who has yep. been like protecting us who for has decades. Who's been a godlike figure, right? Like this golden god who yep. everyone looks up to, and he does PSAs mm -hmm. and he does signings, and like everyone loves him. And he's handsome. And he never ages. And then Arthur tells him that Twitter exists. Right. And he sees and hashtags. One, as right. He says. Hashtags, right. as he calls it. Yeah. And now he's just like, wait, people don't like me, and they're questioning <laughs> my motives. Right. And like, who am I? And it's like some people don't like you, but right. that's enough to right tip him into an existential spiral. Right. 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 Um, so Peter plays yes, the tick. Yes, Sir Finowich, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, your scene partner yeah. in almost every scene, right? Most like scenes, most yeah. Most scenes. Yeah. What's, what's he giving? Like, how do you guys talk about your own dynamic? Because there's so, so much of it is, uh, of the comedy of the tick, is sort of him being arrested in weird yeah. ways, too. Yeah. Like, he just wants to sort of, like, smash through a wall and do something. Right. And he has to do paperwork, or right. you're being, you know, a nincompoop bless or you. whatever. Bless you. Uh, like, bless you. You, yeah. you were very bless like, you. Bless you. Um, uh, Peter and I both come from comedy backgrounds. Right. He comes from a far more successful comedy background, <laughs> but we both come from doing uh, sketch comedy yeah. and things like that. And uh, Peter uh, has a couple incredible uh, comedy shows that he created. And yes, started yes, on does. BBC that people should watch the Pierce Surf in a witch show. That's like an amazing, amazing sketch show. And look around you, which was sold as like it's a like sort of fake like educational. This was content. a 70s children's show right. that you forgot about. It's very good that they would just air in the middle of the night. Yeah, and people would not be sure what it was. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, and I I came from doing uh, uh, sketch comedy stuff in in basements here in the city. So I think we in a way that's very unusual. Mm -hmm. And both of us would have moments on set the last three years of us doing this, because uh, that's the joy of the streaming landscape. Sure. It takes three years to do 22 <laughs> episodes. No, but you release them all at once, right? Or no, you, you got to parse them A couple, them a couple right, parcels, right, 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 yeah. Right. A few parcels. Um, but uh, we'd be like, wow, if I describe this to someone, this would sound like a nightmare, but yeah. we really do run our scenes like we're a comedy team. Because when like you're doing sketch comedy as opposed to when you're doing a play necessarily or any traditional shoot, there's a lot of like collaborative performance stuff because so much of it is timing based or energy based. You have to set me up with this. You have to do that. Hey, can I give you a note? Would it be funny if you said that so I could react this way? Um, which which it's like a, a thing where you have to kind of surrender all ego. Yeah. Because we do have directors on set. Of course. And we have executives. Yeah, right. And we have Ben. We have a showrunner. We have producers. We have other people giving us notes. But internally, we'll note each other mm -hmm. a lot because I think we were aware that it's not just like oh we have a lot of scenes together. It's like we're a comedy duo on the show. Yes. And it's 100%. a very specific, like, we have different pitches and different energies, and we need to constantly be harmonizing. So it's weird. Like, people ask us if we improvise a lot on the show. It's very hard to improvise this dialogue. Right. But more that, often... Yes, that's actually one of the really? questions. Really? Okay. Here. Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, do you want to read how it was worded, or are we going to abandon it? Was, do, you do, uh, a do we do a lot of show? improv while filming? Yes. Thank you, Dexter. It's for everyone, LOL. Um, uh, 
the, the answer is it's hard to improvise the dialogue, but very often, more often, I will go, hey, Peter, it'd be kind of funny if the tech did this, and mm -hmm. he'll pitch me an Arthur thing. Right. And then we'll usually he'll have to bring it, it to in. Ben, and right. he'll have to run it through the Endland machine. <laughs> sure. And he'll translate it into something that works within the show. Right. But more often, it will be us pitching a joke for the other person. Uh, I, right, rather than you just being like, let me try this, and right. Peter being like, oh, that's right. good. You're, right, you're and it's like, that's Peter, what like, it feels what like did this? for right. me doing sketch comedy historically where you're just like, we have to put our egos aside because sure. we just want five minutes with as many laughs as possible, mm -hmm. except it's weird because we're doing it on a set with a bunch of union right. people. Right, and you're in superhero costumes. Yeah, and then the other question, what was your best moment while working on this project? Um, that's a Kind of a big question. That's a big. I'm going to sit on that one okay. for a little. I'm going to think is, on that one. This is another question. This is a very specific question okay. from Douglas McCrell. Uh, if you could have your dream tick toy line, mm -hmm. yeah, what toy or toy line? Toy line. Okay. Toy line. What company would you have produce the line? Who would be in the first wave? And what special features would each figure have? You do not have to answer all of those questions. I can do. I can speed I mean, around it. Just give it. One, give it to me one. visually. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Right. Well, but who's your toy line creator? Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, I knew you would have an answer. I to got this multiple question. I would have no answer. Right. To this I mean, question. we have like two hours left. Um, there's a company called Super Seven who actually oh, makes yeah, right? this uh, clothing item that I'm wearing right now, but they also make a lot of toys. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do like toys that look like 1970s Star Wars action figures. Sure, the little guys. They're little and they look kind of rudimentary, and they have that thing where they're like very rigid yep. uh, and sort of like poorly painted. Uh, and with that sort of like painted card art, uh, yep. uh, that that would be my dream. I think first series. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of like anal retentive about like organization of, of things like this. So I'd be like, series one, let's just do like season one of the show. Okay. You know okay. what I'm saying? Like a series So no Lobster Achilles. No, I'd say yeah. hold off. So right, first right. six would be Arthur, Tick, Dot, mm -hmm. Overkill, mm -hmm. Ms. Lint, and the Terror. Is that six? That's six. Right. We have to save Superion for season two. I was going to say you could fit Superion in. Yeah. yeah. But six is like... Is we'll roll Superior over. That's classic because of its case pack out. A case usually contains. Should Thank just you, walk Doug, off so stage, much for letting right? me do this. Uh, it's usually it's usually six because then you get an even distribution within a case of two per character. <laughs> and a special feature. I'm a very cool person. Yeah, you're super cool. Yeah. Super cool. Special feature. I'm trying to think what the special feature would be. Um, there is. Uh, 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 well, there's the thing with the with the helmet your, your, and the your goggles. goggles come down. Yeah. You have these toggling goggles. Right. I have this helmet that like flips out and the goggles go like And they're for like real, that. right? And the wings, I guess it'd be one of those like a cool. Buzz Lightyear stuff. I want the wings. The wings out. are CG, right? They're they're not real? Yeah, yeah, thank God. They built physical wings uh -huh. and they were like uh It's uh, not going to work. Uh, no. <laughs> right. No. They're really big and they're really heavy and if I uh rotate too quickly, which I'm an antsy person, sure, they will uh, like decapitate me. someone. <laughs> Uh, so we do, we use them just for the photo shoots, uh -huh. right, uh, right, right? For like the posters. But and do stuff. The, the goggles flip on and off? Like, are they real or are they that's, fake too? That's CGI, and that's a lot of fun to do. Uh, he says sarcastically. Yeah, I was about to say that does because, not sound fun to do. Right, it's one of those things where it's like you have to shoot everything like four times because mm -hmm. you like shoot it without the helmet on, mm -hmm. then you shoot it with the helmet on, mm -hmm. you shoot it with the goggles in the two positions. Like they have physical yeah. representations for everything, right. but the thing isn't mechanized. So you have to shoot the same thing like three times in a row, and they'll like note they'll you would be like the, the centimeters change, right. of your nose oh has to be God. at that exact angle, and then they they combine them all in CGI. But and I think you've talked about I do love this that and I feel like everyone should know is that the ticks antenna are yes. uh, uh, practical, one hundred percent practical, and zero CGI whatsoever. And we they're have, being yeah. operated live. Yes, yes. Uh, we ha we have a puppeteer named uh, Laura McLean who uh, is on the call sheet every day Hell yeah. uh, and is treat, uh, treated as she should be as a performer, performer an right, actor right. in the cast right. uh, because she's giving this tandem performance with Peter, which is uh, very unusual. Uh, yeah. Uh, sometimes he will give her a suggestion, but very often he has no idea what she's doing. How could he? But Being she sort of sits him. in the corner very studiously and she's yeah. like a vet of the Henson Company in Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. uh, a thing, I, a, a fact I love about her is that uh, one of her big things she does is she makes all the cookies for Cookie Monster because she has the right sized oven 
few people in New York City have the right sized oven to okay. make a good Cookie Monster cookie. So she like knows they the recipe. They need to be very crumbly, I would assume. Right? It's tough because they have yeah. to have some structural integrity. Right. That they have to fall apart. They can't be chewy though, right? Because they Cause need he to. Have teeth. He doesn't have, they have a to mouth. Fall apart, right. I mean, it doesn't. But go he has anywhere. to be able to get them to the mouth, yeah. and then yeah. they fall apart mm -hmm. perfectly. Okay. So she's a genius, mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. And she just sits in the corner. She sounds like a muppet. She goes like, "Well, I'm trying my hardest." Oh my god! And she sits there with a hat on and sort of like a raincoat. And she's, and got she's just little, she's yeah. got like it looks like a remote control helicopter. Uh -huh. Like one toggle is one antenna, one toggle is the other antenna, and she just watches and comes up with notes. And she literally has she created a vocabulary. Right. She made a book that she uh, handed she over really to the created. marketing okay. people because uh, they found this out at one point. They used it for like press stuff uh, when they had to create imagery where she was like, this is the vocabulary of what positions connote which uh, emotions. I was gonna, it's like an emotional, right? It's like right. he's interested, he's scared, he's, well, right. he's probably never scared, I guess. That's not no, really he, well, a tick yeah. emotion. He's, he's scared of paperwork. Scared yeah. of paperwork, right. And then sometimes it, she just, you just come up with something funny. Sometimes right. you just go, it'd be funny if it just went like this right now, you know? Of course. Or if he went in the direction of whatever. But yeah. I feel like when I watched season one, I did not know that when the show first, and yeah. watching season two, I was aware of it, and I pay a weird amount of attention to what it's his antenna so, are doing. She, they are doing yeah. all kinds of stuff. Right. She is uh, uh, such a smart actor. Sure. It's one of those things where like, I, I feel like similarly people don't think of animators as actors. No, right. But they're right, creating, right. But they're a, creating performance, a performance, even right. if it's not in their own body, and she's doing uh, the same thing. Uh, and we had like a crisis. I'll say this now. Sure. But we had a crisis, a crisis this season where um, they totally redid the suit from season one. Right, which you sort of, he like molts. Right, right. right. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's evolved. Which is kind of a funny workaround, right. honestly. Right, and there were a lot of problems with the se uh, suit in season one yeah. in, in every possible uh, sense. Your suit is similar. Your suit didn't really change Very that much. small changes, yeah, 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 right. 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 Uh, but Peter's, they sort of started over from, from scratch and then wrote it into the script. Right. Um, and they rounds and rounds of fittings and testings because there's R and D that has to go into it. You have the mechanisms in the head, and yeah. this is glued down to his face, and then this is baked in. And they have to build the mic packs and the battery packs, and all, all right. this stuff, right? Sure. Uh, and we get on set in the first day, and he'd been doing the costume things for months and months and months, and we were everyone was like, "This is great!" Like it was he's the scene where it. we right. see him and he starts moving, and we we're like, "Oh my god, he's got this flexibility. He couldn't move like this in season one." And we start the first take, and they turn it on. And the antennas are uh, incredibly loud. Oh right, yes, right. It sounds like a root canal. <laughs> it's just like a <laughs> like right, 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 right. right. <laughs> <laughs> Had no one thought, or was it more just this was unavoidable? It was one of those things right. that's <laughs> the magic <laughs> of uh, uh, production, where you just like haven't, you don't know until everything's there at the one moment. So they had tested right. they everything. They had finally put it all together. They tested yeah, in a yeah. warehouse yeah, where they make yeah. the suit, and he doesn't have to memorize dialogue while they're doing the fittings and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then they ran it, and it was just like uh, all of us were like, "Is the is the show over?" Right. And they turned to the sound woman, and they were like, "Are you picking that up?" And she was like. Yeah, 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 right, up. yeah. The, the very loud right. noise? Yeah, no, we got that. Right. And Peter was like, "It sounds like there's like <laughs> AOL dial-up in my head." I was like, "No, no, 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 no." Um, but it was this thing where we're like, we can't just uh, junk it because it's so much a part of the character and the and yeah. the personality. So they they had to sort of start over and by like episode three they they had fixed the antenna, but the first two were rough. Interesting. Rough because he could very rarely uh, hear what we were saying. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That seems like an issue. Yeah. And Listening, then our reacting. The, the, uh, the sound people on the show developed a technology to be able to isolate the sound so of frequency like lift it out. and lift it out, yeah. I'm gonna ask, I'm, we sort of talked about this, but this is the mm -hmm. last question we got from Nico. Uh, do you see the success of the superhero genre as being tied to the political climate, which is sort of what we were talking about, but uh, I think yeah. so. I feel like you and I as like uh, uh, people, uh, big old nerds, uh, uh, but people who also love contextualizing things in terms of like... Uh, sure, like what's happening in the culture that would right. produce something like this or produce right. something like this that uh, connects right. with people. Right, it's like yeah. it kind of makes sense that like superheroes really started hitting in the 40s. Yep, You know, right, 100%. And then almost always had a resurgence tied to a war. Mm -hmm. And that this yeah. modern superhero era we're living in really kind of blew up post 9-11. L I mean, it felt literally. like a very direct sort of like the two things I remember being like, oh, this is really telling our uh, 
uh, in 2001, mm -hmm. like there was this major upswing in superhero interest leading to Spider-Man the following year. And uh, and and all the fantasy things when like Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings, those two movies yep. came out. That's and linked it was to like one. Yep. right. People want to see these stories that are about like unquestionable forces of evil. Yes. And people choosing to stand up to them to and, the call. and try to combat it, answer the call. Mm -hmm. um, so I yeah, I think you know it's uh, when people ask like when is the superhero trend going to run out. Sure. The kind of scary answer is like. Take a look around. Like, yeah. do things look like they're going to get right. like, uh, a lot smoother? We're all just getting increasingly more and more uh, scared. And I think this is a very unique time culturally because it's a time where, like, uh, no one's happy. You know, right. very often one side is winning right. and going right. like, right. man, but no, yeah, boo -boo, right. and Everyone's the other unhappy. side. Right. Everyone, act, everyone has this complex of they're out to get me. <laughs> the, the evil forces are fighting against me, you know? Yeah. Which yeah. is why you see all this online discourse of like, no, Superman would vote for my candidate, yeah, sure. not your candidate. Right. And it's like people always are going to want to map onto these characters and what they believe that they're uh, fighting for. And I think this season's a lot about that sort of uh, uh, gray area. Yeah, and it's about how like some like Love Circulars or yeah, these villains may right. have more complex things going on with them than they first present, right? Right. Love Circulars is certainly like an other in yes, this universe. We right. haven't dealt with monsters before, right? And it's very easy to go like a monster. You fight a monster, right. Right. which is what we do in this episode, but we start to reassess that as the season goes on. Great scene in my opinion. Uh, thank when, you. When the, the sort of reversal, yes. of it, which is, uh, if you keep watching. Episode five, episode Yeah, second. episode five. Uh, and, and then the other thing is, you know, I think like, oh my God, we're legitimate. We're gonna get recruited into this industry. Yeah, right, right. And this agency, yeah. this hero of mine is bringing us in. We're gonna have all this power. You want the sort of rubber stamp, right? Right, and then immediately it's like, oh, if you wanna do that, you have to file like four forms and get approved by like six agents, mm -hmm. which I feel like, you know, when I read uh, uh, political news, sure. I'm like, why can't they just do this? Right. And it's like, because everything's this weird kind of negotiation. Right. You're constantly trying to choose which concessions you make for what greater good, which I think for Tick and Arthur is scary because the Tick is the tick's like, like, I know what's good. Yeah. T the Tick is like a kid doing an impression of a superhero yeah. on a playground right. where he's like, I fight bad guys yeah. and I know what bad I guys look like. evil. Right. right. Yeah. And Arthur is someone who's kind of been uh, thrown out by society. Right and doubted and, and questioned, and he's done the research to really figure out what the evil powers at play are. So Arthur has real kind of awareness, sure. and Tick has instinct. Yeah. Double bless you. Double bless you. But same person? <laughs> cool. I hope you're feeling okay. Um, Seasons change. I have yeah. to me too. Uh, but, th but that's, I mean, those are the kind of stories that I like watching. I was excited when that was what this season ended up being sure. about, because I think those sort of questions of just like, how do you do the right thing mm -hmm. are kind of interesting. I agree. Yeah. We're done. We're done? Okay, We're wait, done. what was the question I had to go back to? Oh, oh, the, your favorite thing. What was my favorite thing? Uh, I don't um, know. What's the best, best moment? Best moment. Moment's a really key word here. You know, I mean, it is one of those things where there are, like, so many scenes where it, my my job is to, like, just look at the pages try, to, try sure. to invest as much reality into it, this and that. But there are the days where you like look around and you're like, uh, wh what am I doing here? Uh -huh. Like I, I have an emotional scene with a lobster monster. <laughs> A good scene. Uh, uh, episode four of uh, the, the, the bottle episode. This season is a bottle episode that takes place inside of a character. Yes. There's a character in our show named Danger Boat, who's who sort a of boat. A, uh, a boat. He identifies as a mail boat. Yep. He's kind of like Knight Rider. Yep. He's like a super advanced computer boat, and he is sexually attracted to Arthur. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's my love interest on the show. It is. It's a great storyline. Uh, is a set. Yep. Uh, it's always great. Voiced oh. by Alan Tudyk. Voiced by Alan Tudyk, who yeah. I've never met. Sure, it's, that's right. another really <laughs> interesting thing about the show. Because people will watch the show and they're like, what's you, it like do, Alan, doing scenes right. with Danger Bone? I'm like, never met Alan Tudyk. Yeah. It's always a first day to your PA reading the dialogue. Sure. And it's planks of wood. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's acting, my boy. Uh, I'm trying to think of best moment. You know, there's one, I, I mean, it's coming to mind just because it came out uh, today. Uh, but there was a day, uh, I have a big fight scene in like episode seven, maybe. Right. Um, and, and the tick is trying to come in and rescue me. Right. And he's supposed to sort of barge in. And at the moment he barges in, it's too late and I've lost my fight and I'm sort of like passed out. 
you know, birds circling yep. around my head cartoon style. Not literally. I'm saying yeah, it's that no, it's, type of energy in a bathtub right. of a motel, right? And he's like, Arthur. Uh, and when we were shooting it, mm -hmm. Long days, it was the end of a week, it was a really physical day in this very small set shooting fight scenes. Uh, Peter uh, barged through and uh, pulled the door off its hinges. Wow. It, it truly was like a tick like right. feat of, of superheroism. He barged through, Arthur! And he like threw the door and it landed on top of me. Wow. And uh, he immediately went from like in character going like this to then going like, ah! <laughs> like terrified. Right. And I was fine. I like caught the door. Sure. But the moment was so good and it was so genuine genuine and it was such a beautiful overlap between like uh, our characters and our, our actual relationship yes, as actors. Real dynamic, yeah. Right. That then we were like, you know what? Let's take an hour and reset and go back and shoot my coverage again because uh -huh. now we're going to make the scene that he threw a door on top of <laughs> me. <laughs> right. So we did that. So we did that. So we used the take. Uh, it's his real reaction to right. thinking that he's maybe killed me. <laughs> And then we shot new footage of me like pushing the door off of me, and that was that was kind of a beautiful. That's moment. a beautiful moment. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you all. Griffin for Newman, out. everybody. Yeah. Uh, watch the rest of the season and tell people, please. Watch it. Amazon. <laughs>